everyone. It's great to be here virtually at Cloud Native DevEx uh, Day, especially during these uh, unprecedented times. Uh, myself and Pat are here to tell you about how our team have gone from villains to heroes uh, and how we managed to improve our developers' experience and therefore make our devs happy. Uh, so, who am I? Uh, my name is Anna Khalid and I'm a software engineer at Influx Data. And I've been working there, uh, working on maintaining our platform, built on top of Kubernetes and cloud, and also making uh, some of our other software engineers happy-ish. Before we talk more about our superhero-ish capabilities, let's meet uh, my friend, my safe person, and my manager, Pat. Oh, thank you, Anna. All right, hi, I'm Pat Gaunt. I work with Anna at Influx Data. I'm an engineering manager. I'm the engineering manager of our deployments team. So give me the next one. So what we're gonna tell you about today, we're gonna tell you a little about our story. We're gonna tell you about the company. We're gonna tell you briefly about what we do. And it's gonna describe our users. We're gonna to talk to you about what we tried to do from a development environment perspective and then where we've ended up. So next one. So first, before we do that, yeah. So first, Influx Data. We are a company that behind, we're behind, the company behind the time series database called Influx DB. So, in uh, about a couple of years ago, we started a SaaS offering. And so, since data has gravity, people care where it is. We're doing this multi cloud, so across Amazon, Google, Azure, multi region. And so, we're um, all told we have about, you counted it, Anna, I think it's 17, but I'm going to say, approximately 15 environments running across the clouds in the regions. And they're all, each of those are running on top of a Kubernetes cluster. And so all told within each of those Kubernetes clusters, with, when, within each of those environments, we're running 30 plus services. All these services together make the database and how you interact with that data coming in and going out. So very quickly, so what our deployments team does is we are in charge of the whole um, development and delivery pipeline. So um, our team runs our whole CI CD pipeline and we continuously deliver. So um, so from the so an engineer writes their code, commits it, and, and it enters CI. Once it completes that, if it's successful, it goes into um, our deployment pipeline it, and it's across all three of our staging clusters. If that's successful, it's automatically promoted to internal production. And then finally, it's then promoted to external production where then it's available to all of our customers. To make that happen, we needed to provide an environment for our development team to, as they're writing code, have a development as much as they can have a production-like experience. And so I wanted to quickly, before I hand it over to Anna, I wanted to mention who our team's customers are. Our team's customers primarily are the development teams. So I'm gonna let Anna take it from here. Um, so now that we do, you do have an idea of what um, our team does, um, we have pictured here two personas to represent our different engineers that we serve. So um, they are somewhat similar with a few exceptions. So our front-end engineer that sometimes is called the UI developer um, expects an instant feedback loop, expects a realistic prod-like environment, and doesn't need to be concerned with the Kubernetes details, and it has a main focus on the UI. On the other hand, we have the back-end engineer uh, who expects a fast-ish feedback loop. Um, so like, you know, slightly- A minute, a minute, yes. Anna. A fast. minute. Uh, a wait for a build, maybe. Exactly, yeah. Um, they um, also want a realistic prod-like environment. And whether they like it or not, sometimes they have to care about Kubernetes. They also need some service transparency uh, because they usually work on more than one service. So they need some sort of monitoring for that. And um, they tend to deal with a widespread net of issues. And um, we do have um, in both of our uh, front end and back end uh, teams, engineers that are very good with Kubernetes, but they most of them don't like to touch it. 
Okay, so what is the solution that we came up with? In 2020, we came up with an approach that looked a bit like this. Um, so um, on each one of uh, using Kubernetes in Docker um, and Docker desktop, our team created a set of um, make targets um, that our engineers could use to deploy a slim down uh, local Kubernetes uh, cluster that contained our application. As part of the cluster, we had the same setup um, that um, we simply referred to as kind. So um, on an engineer machine, you would have kind plus Docker, uh, then you'd have the app deploying its own namespace on a kind node and plus other namespaces used for um, for the maintenance of the whole uh, mini, the whole kind cluster. And um, this was somewhat functional, but uh, we had quite a few issues with it. But before we go into those issues, um, Pat, uh, would you like to play a game with me? You know I'm always in for a game. All okay, right. so then let's do this um, guessing game. I'm going to play to you two sound clips. And I want you, don't cover your eyes, it's okay. <laughs> I want you to um, listen to them and try to guess what they are. And there might be a clue in the picture, but maybe not. Oh, technical difficulties, as always. <laughs> okay, one. Something bad is about to happen. Okay. Okay. So what yeah. do you think these sounds are of? Airplanes. The first one's like a propeller plane that's about to go down. The other one is like, I'm sitting on one of the big planes headed across the ocean and I've got the window seat right over the engine and I'm trying to sleep and I hear that sound. It's, it's terrible. Airplanes. Both of them. Very, very specific. Yes, very um, specific. Especially the second one. Yes. So you're right. The first one is a, some sort of propeller plane, but the second one is actually a computer overheating. And <laughs> uh, I should know. It, it doesn't sound too dissimilar to how our MacBooks would overheat when running Kind and Docker. So. <laughs> Let's talk about it's challenges. It's so true. I should know this. So um, challenges. So give it a click. And uh, some of the challenges we had with kind, well, of course it jumps through. That's fine. We'll keep going. So, you know, people, people didn't have um, necessarily resources, system resources to get it dedicate to kind. And so like they try to use it, the machine starts sending like an airplane and they can't they can't work on code while they're running kind. It sounds like it's dying. Sometimes people install software from different places. And then we're also supporting several different um, operating systems, operating system versions or distro preferences, all these sorts of things. Give me another click, give me another click. And then, you know, people don't know if it's them or it's kind. It felt very brittle, very fragile. They'd go to use it one day, it would work that day. They'd use it the next day, it wouldn't. It felt hard, it felt really painful. But so I think that we all at the time were kind of left at the question of why is this so hard? Like it just, it just felt hard. So uh, yeah, just going back. So our developers didn't change, but we realized we needed to change something. Like what we'd offered just didn't fit the demands and what they needed from us still the same, nothing changed here. So these are still our developers, still wanting something better. So what we came up with is remocal. And that comes from the combination of remote and local. And Anna is gonna tell you a little bit more why it's not just fully remote. So as much, of we, as, much as we can, we're pushing it, we're pushing things off to a remote cluster, getting things off of people's system. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here, Anna. Okay, so um, we came up with a dedicated GKE cluster 
in which by running a couple of CLI commands, a developer can spin up their own namespace containing a slimmed down version of our application and all of its components. So what that meant is that none of these developers uh, had to run a Docker for desktop and any more kind. Okay, so, um, so uh, the way the cluster looks is quite similar to how it looked locally, uh, with the exception that you have many different uh, namespaces. But let's go to one workflow. So let's say you are a Golang developer on our backend um, team, and you want to apply a change to a backend service. So after deploying the app in your dedicated uh, namespace uh, using make deploy um, remoker, uh, what you need to do is simply uh, run this one command here, uh, which is make remote dev, and then you pass the name of your service, any backend service, as a variable to, to app. And what, what does, that does is um, um, Garden would sync the source code from the backend repository to the remote deployment or stateful set that matches your, let's say you are uh, uh, the person whose namespace is the one namespace. And that's triggering a build of a new binary and restarting uh, the binary on any ch uh, change. So what that means is that now you can continue interacting with your uh, repository um, that's on your local machine. And um, every time new code is built, a pod will restart and that will contain um, all of the changes that you made. So Anna, before you click, before you click, I wanted to add one yes. thing. So this is very similar to, similar to what we're doing in CI. The only difference is we don't have that garden system namespace because we're we're spinning up the clusters fresh each, each time versus a developer making changes and we're wanting to update their service within the environment. So okay, now now you click. Well, before I click, I also want to say that in CI, we're also using kind. So when we moved, we moved both the CI and the developers um, way of using. Yeah, we stopped kind using, yeah, we had been using kind before. So we moved away from kind for both CI and developers. You're right. Yes. Um, so if you're a front end developer, um, your flow is a bit, a bit different. Um, so you still would run make deploy uh, remote call to spin up your namespace. And then when you start developing uh, the UI locally against Kubernetes, you are running a web back and your all of your normal dev tools um, as normal, but your code is not running in Kubernetes. So your code lives on your local machine and is talking directly using telepresence, which acts as a reverse proxy that sends all requests uh, to the web pack, um, web pack dev server on your computer. So when your browser talks to your instance of the app, requests for UI are sent to the Kubernetes cluster um, and back to your computer. And all of these processes are luckily fast enough to make the de uh, development a comfortable experience. Make um, it in the, those front end does get their instantaneous development environment sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say is, um, yeah, for front end developer on your local machine, you have a tel telepresence reverse proxy and a web pack dev server, in addition to all of the other things that you need as a back end uh, developer. And the command to run this would be very similar to the other command, except that the app you point uh, is a front end service app rather than um, back end. Cool. So um, we mentioned in our talk abstract that we're going to talk about the, uh, the four um, uh, developer experience pillars and how we managed to add those into our solution. Well, first of all, the first um, pillar for a good developer experience is function. And really, it's what it says on the team, what we promised we delivered. Um, we asked for feedback early, 
and often during the development process and there are things that we kept and there are things that uh, changed completely. Um, the next uh, developer uh, experience pillar that uh, you have to keep in mind uh, when providing a developer experience is clarity. And what that meant for us is that it took the guessing away from um, whenever a developer would come to us to say, hey, this is not working, whether it was a user error or whether it was an actual concern. So um, by virtue of our engineers having their kind set up locally, what that meant for me and my teammates was that um, the troubleshooting with someone could take up to a day because you'd go through things like, okay, so um, is it working for anyone else? Can I recreate the issue locally on my machine? Um, if not, can I go with the person um, that has an issue? Can I go to every single one of their steps? Um, there are so many different components in play that uh, it just wasn't a great experience. It did not give us uh, enough transparency to be able to uh, troubleshoot properly. Whereas now, if uh, any uh, engineer comes to us to say something's not working, all we have to ask is, okay, what's your namespace? And uh, uh, myself or my colleagues can just uh, log into the GKE cluster, into that namespace and see what the issue could be. Next pillar is stability. And I think um, Pat knows a bit yes, more so about it. <laughs> yes, I think. I mean, this, this I know is... things too. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, you do, you do. Um, so I think this is like, to me, this feels like kind of a, a journey when it comes to uh, software in the cloud. But um, we, so like through the development process, like as we were working on this, like as we like move from kind to remote for like CI, um, we were running um, the, like, we were running the new way in parallel to the old way. And so like the whole time we were getting feedback, like, are we getting good results? Is, are things looking good? H launching hundreds of instances of it, making sure, um, la launching hundreds of namespaces, sorry, not instances of, to, to make sure that like, kind of like working out the kinks, seeing if we can make it work better, seeing if it, we can work faster. We also are monitoring it. So we have, um, we're, we're keeping track of like, long running namespaces, seeing what's going on, memory, CPU utilization, and, and, and all of that. So. Um, so as we started with this new solution, we did have some challenges. Um, mostly all of the software that you use, specifically Garden IO and Telepresence did um, what we wanted, but there were some features missing. So to give you an example, uh, with Garden. So Garden doesn't support out of the box JSON it, but we would dynamically um, uh, uh, generate YAML using our JSON it code, and then Garden would manage that YAML code. So we managed to find a solution around that. Um, the other issue with Garden was that um, out of the box, when we started using it, it was only um, able to manage deployment or daemon set resources. And some of our um, services were managed by uh, CRDs, custom resource definitions. So um, a way that Garden has worked with us um, to address this was by um, adding a feature that lets you specify a pod selector um, instead of the resource type uh, so that Garden can, uh, can manage a resource by pod selector. We also had, um, you know, uh, as any experience, uh, there was a hill to climb and uh, we didn't have anyone who had specific expertise with telepresence in our team. So we all, uh, we had to learn as we went. And then there were some early robustness issues with, telegra uh, with the telepresence. Telegraph is um, <laughs> one of our little components part of the product. So um, uh, if someone tried a new version of telepresence in the, the, the whole, um, in the 
using the remote cluster uh, that would bring down the whole cluster for everyone. So that was quite the experience, but that's no longer an issue now. Um, Nicole, can I take it over? Can I take it over from here? Okay, cool. All right. And so I think I think the next one we didn't give ourselves a check mark on because like it's not fully gone. We don't we haven't we have not completely gotten rid of like we still have a local development environment, like a local developer system surface area. We've greatly reduced it by moving most things for to the remote cluster where we still have telepresence running locally. And so, you know, we had to do some stuff in the code to make sure that the agent and the telepresence were always on the same version, but we, we, we got through that. So, so I just wanted to, when we launched Remocal, um, it was actually a different experience than with Kind. When we lost Kind, we like had to kind of convince users that they had to use it. There was none of that here. You know what I'm talking about, Anna? They got on it. And so right away we were getting a lot of like, Okay, I don't, you decide if it's a lot. I felt like it was like, it was really, I was really proud of the people I was working with when we got all this feedback. I mean, just like really good, positive feedback. Did it, did it stay that way? It was probably best we did name the presentation happy-ish because this was a good day and, and not all the rest of them are, but um, it's been, it's, I would say overall, the feedback's been really good. We've had some challenges and we're gonna share some of the things we're still working on in the next slide. Well, I just want to mention on this part that I do specifically remember that a couple of our developers were um, using remote code before it was uh, fully available to everyone. Before yeah, we they were liking it yeah. and they, were, they yeah. were telling their friends. You know it's good when they're telling their friends. Okay. So some of the things were, oh, it went one too far, but that's okay. So some of the things we're still working on is like I mentioned happy-ish. We had it, we had in a situation where we made a change. We didn't think anyone cared. We like got rid of a service to try to reduce um, memory utilization. Turns out people did were using it. So we need to do better communicating. We're working on being better at communicating, especially about things we don't think anyone cares about, but they do. And also messaging it in the right way. So they know like why they might maybe care. And then we're also always continuing to work on improving the stability. I think we've come a long way, um, but it's something we, we watch, we're measuring, we're keeping track of. We're also, you know, users find, find bugs, we're prioritizing that and making sure that those like, it's the top of our, top, top of our sprint load is to address feedback. And then we're trying to add features just to, to keep our engineers happy-ish. So specifically we're a database company. So we're trying to, we're currently, um, adding a feature that lets them preload data and having kind of a data catalog so they can load different types of data based on what they're trying to get done. So next, finally, Anna mentioned that it was something she was doing with her colleagues. Um, Opie Amy and Wojciech are two of the like developers that did a lot of the heavy lifting on this project. I mean, I can't say, I mean, the whole team, <laughs> it's been a whole team effort, but I felt like we couldn't Neither of us felt we could get through this presentation without specifically thanking these two. So thank yeah, you. They Opie deserve and they deserve thank special you. thanks for this project. Yes. And that brings us to the end. So thank you so much. Uh, this has been an adventure. Anna? Uh, sorry, we weren't able to be there. Thank you. And uh, we'll take some questions. <laughs>